sound okay? Awesome. Uh, so thank you for all for being here at 360 iDev. Uh, my name is Conrad, and I work on mobile apps at Under Armour, uh, mostly Map My Run, a little bit on My Fitness Pal, and I also happen to love enums, and they're basically my favorite feature in Swift. Um, so that's what I want to talk to you all about today. <clears throat> Uh, they're certainly not just my favorite feature. Uh, I wanted to give a quick tip of the hat to good friend Casey Liss, who wrote a very similarly titled blog post about just how enums, how awesome enums are, just three weeks into using Swift uh, back in 2016. So if uh, this talk makes you think more about using enums and you're looking for more information, I think Casey's blog is a great place to start. So I think a lot of people discover enums pretty quickly when they're exposed to Swift. I think they're arguably one of the most powerful Swift language features. And many of us have probably used enums before in other programming languages. Uh, sometimes we might even be using enums without even realizing it. But I think enums are so valuable a tool that they're worth designing software around, similar to object-oriented programming or protocol-oriented programming. And it's what I think of as state-driven development. And really, that's what this talk is all about. So before we get to enums, let's start with something that we're all even more familiar with. Um, it's something that we probably use every day while writing code. And that's bool. Specifically, bools that are used as local instance variables that describe the state that an object is in. They're actually a tool that we use all the time. Uh, we define these properties on objects that we create ourselves or uh, set them on other objects, uh, usually because they're convenient to interact with. Um, and how often exactly do we use them? Uh, we can actually use a regular expression to search an Xcode and have it tell us exactly how often a pattern like this is used. Um, this isn't a complete example, and some of you probably know how to construct the regex for this better than I do, but this is just one example. In the project find navigator in Xcode, you can select regular expression from the drop down menu and enter the pattern that you want to match. And you'll probably be pretty surprised by what you find. Uh, I certainly know that I was. Um, we basically use these things everywhere. Uh, here are just a few of the examples that I found in one of my projects. And this is just a simple shopping list app that really only has one screen and just one purpose. Um, and some of these are fairly clear in terms of what they mean and when they should be true or false. But that's really the problem with Boolean state variables is it's sometimes hard to understand what they mean and know when they should be true or false. Um, how often do their values change or who is responsible for setting them to true? Um, if one is true, should the other ones be false? Like how do these variables relate to each other? So let's go through an example. Uh, let's say that we're building an app for tracking workouts. And the app has just one purpose, to allow the user to track a workout. So when the user opens the app, they can always start a workout. So you just have some code that looks like this. You have a start workout method, and it performs some work to start a workout. Simple and easy. Uh, this works for a little while, but then you realize that the user needs to be logged in before they can start a workout. So how does your object know if the user is logged in or not? You add a Boolean state variable to represent whether or not the user is logged in. Now you can guard against a user who isn't logged in and prevent them from starting a workout. Still seems simple enough. But then you realize there's another requirement missing from this method. If you call this method twice, you can actually start duplicate workouts. So to prevent that from happening, we add another Boolean state variable to track whether or not there's a workout in progress. We need to remember to set this property to true um, when we start our workout, and we need to add another case to our guard statement. So now we can only have one workout running at a time, and the user still has to be logged in before they can start a workout. But this is already getting pretty complicated. Um, first of all, who sets has logged into true? Can it ever be false again after that point? Um, should it be false for other reasons, or if workout in progress is true, should has logged in ever be false? I'm not really sure. But now we receive another requirement for our start workout method. We want to prevent starting a workout 
a new workout while we're in the middle of saving the previous workout. This is where our web of state starts to get very tangled. Saving a workout is an asynchronous task, and until it's finished, um, we can't start another workout. So we add a new variable to track whether or not we're currently saving a workout. So we set that to true when we stop the workout and back to false after the workout finishes saving. And we also have to remember to set workout in progress equal to false since we're no longer actively tracking a workout. Uh, if we go back to our start workout method, we need to add a third case to our guard. So the user still has to be logged in and they can't start a workout if there is a workout currently being tracked or being saved. But that's turning into a really long guard statement and I'm starting to spend a lot of cycles trying to figure out what it's telling me. Just to recap, the user should not be able to start a workout if they haven't logged in, they're in the middle of a workout, or are saving the last workout. And the user, there's only really one case where they should be able to start a workout, and that's when they're ready to start a workout, which just happens to be the state our app is in when those other three states are um, satisfied. So the crazy thing about Boolean state variables here is that even though our app can only be in four valid states, we can actually be in eight distinct states because of how Boolean variables work. Um, we should really only be in any of the four main states that we're trying to model um, so that the user is not logged in and they have no workouts in progress, or they are logged in and are ready to start a workout, or they're logged in and they're either tracking or saving a workout. But these other four states are still possible to represent even though they're not actually valid. So having a state where the user is not logged in, but they have a workout in progress or are currently saving a workout just doesn't make sense. And that's why this is the perfect scenario for creating an enum. We have four valid states that we've identified, and we know that our object can only ever be in one of these states. So we need to construct an enum that shows exactly which of these four states our object is in. So these are the four valid states. And here's what they look like represented as an enum. So we have four cases, the not logged in, workout in progress, saving last workout, and ready to start a new workout. And these states actually define the life cycle of our app. And now that we're using an enum, we've made our invalid states impossible to represent in our code, which in turn makes several types of bugs also impossible to write. That's a big part of why we like building apps in a strongly typed language like Swift in the first place. So enums help us be very specific about the state of an object, and that's really what state-driven development is all about. So let's start converting the rest of our code to use enums and see what that's like. So here's the code we had before. Uh, first, we're going to get rid of the Boolean state variables and replace them with one lifecycle variable that defaults to not logged in. So once we have our lifecycle variable defined, we can check that our enum is equivalent to a certain case to decide if we want to start a workout. And here's what that looks like in a guard statement. Um, it works just as well in an if statement. We can use the case pattern matching syntax, which is the second example, um, to guard that we're in the ready to start state. Um, both of these statements are valid. Both of these guard statements are valid. Um, we can either use pattern matching syntax or check the equivalence of the lifecycle variable to the case that we're looking for. But checking for a specific case of an enum is really only slightly better than checking the value of Boolean state variables. When you check for a specific case of an enum, you're taking responsibility for what to do in that state. So whenever you start to check for a specific case of an enum, ask yourself if that check could be a variable or a method that gets defined on your enum itself. That way, we're asking our enum to describe possible behaviors for us and then letting the enum use its cases to implement those behaviors for all the possible states we want to handle. So we can extend our enum by defining a variable that describes when we should be able to start a workout. We can really only start a workout in the ready to start case, so we're going to return false for all the other cases and return true in the ready to start case. 
And now we can use this variable to decide if we should be able to start a workout or not. Um, if we want to, we can also simplify the implementation of this method. So in this particular case, since three of the states are returning the same value, we can combine them with commas into a single line. Uh, another option is to use fall-through syntax. So fall-through does require the explicit use of the fall-through keyword in Swift. Um, other languages like Objective-C opt you into that behavior by default. Um, but I, I kind of like this syntax, so I've been using it more often lately. But I really prefer either of these options to using default. If you use default, the compiler won't warn you to implement this method for new cases when you add them to your enum. And so that's likely to create bugs in the future when you go to modify or extend your behavior. So now we're ready to update our original method to use our enum instead of Boolean state. Um, so let's see what that looks like. So we've gotten rid of our Boolean state and we're guarding against our, our, we're guarding our sort workout method um, to make sure that our life cycle can, is ready to start a workout. Um, or that our life cycle can start a workout. Um, and we also have to remember to set our state correctly. So we're setting life cycle equal to the workout in progress case. And if we also go back to our start, stop workout method, we need to set our life cycle correctly to indicate that we're either saving our last workout or that we're ready to start a new workout. Um, and kind of as a happy side effect, everything on the slide is green now. Um, when I picked this deck set theme, I didn't actually intend for true false to be colored red um, in case to be colored green, but it kind of fits the theme of this talk, which is basically about replacing Boolean state variables with enums. So let's keep going. Below our enum cases, we can find variables directly on our enum to describe the behaviors we care about implementing with our object. So now we can ask the state for answers to questions that we care about, like what are the bar button items for a view controller? Every time you think about checking the state of an enum or checking the state of a variable to determine what a return value should be or what action to take, ask yourself if that value or action could be defined on the enum, which is actually responsible for defining what the possible states are in the first place. So here's another example. Uh, we have a method that needs to return the action title to show in a button. And we can use the enum state to decide what content to show um, or how another component should be styled. So in this example, our enum knows the state of our life cycle, so it can return the correct title for each state. This is probably going to be a lot cleaner than checking the state of a Boolean in like a view setup method to decide what the title should be. Where I think this gets really interesting is when you're deciding how a button should behave, like what action should be taken when the button is pressed. So in this example, our view controller has a did tap action button method, but instead of implementing the functionality itself inside of that method, it's turning that over to the enum to handle. So the enum knows what action to take based on the state it is in. So the action taken method on the enum gets passed a reference to the view controller, and the enum can then therefore take advantage of the public API defined on that component without having to know anything about its internal structure. So here the view controller is exposing a start, stop, and save workout method that the enum can use. So now the logic for what to do when a button is pressed is entirely encapsulated in the thing that describes what the possible states are. So if it comes time to change behavior for a certain state, now you only have one place to look to know how to change that behavior. Um, and this pattern is incredibly helpful as well when it comes time to add new behavior to an existing class. So all you have to do when you want to add new behavior is add a new case to your enum and add implementations to all of your methods specifically to handle the new case. Um, the methods that are part of your enum basically become the public API for extending the behavior of your object. So you just go down and fix your, all of the switch statements and all of your methods to support the new enum case. And that eliminates so much of the guesswork involved with changing behavior, because normally you would effectively just have to do a project find for 
variables and try to look for where they're used and decide how to change those methods to support the new behavior that you're trying to model. So instead, when you're using an enum to model that state for you, you just have one place to look to change or extend that behavior. I think my favorite Swift enum feature is associated values. So an associated value is basically a tuple that you can add to any enum case. So you can access the associated values stored in that case, cases tuple, whenever you need to. And here's what the syntax looks like for specifying that an enum case has an associated value. So the enum case here is workout in progress, and current is the parameter name of a workout object. So when you want to get the associated value out of an enum, you can do it inside of a switch statement or using the if case pattern matching syntax. Um, since the value is a constant, you do need to use let to tell Swift to treat it as a constant. Somewhat confusingly, all of these are actually valid syntax for obtaining an associated value from an enum case. The associated value itself can be either used or ignored. Um, and likewise, the call site name can be used or ignored, similar to how you create a tuple in Swift. And let can also be after the case or inside the parentheses. Um, and if you have multiple associated values on an enum case um, and you add let after the case outside of the parentheses, then let will apply to all the associated values that are part of your enum, which removes a little bit of code duplication. You don't have to add let before each parameter inside the parentheses. Um, and the same deal is, is true for the swi for a switch syntax. Um, so all of these are valid as well. Um, same thing with uh, let either being after the case or inside the parentheses. Um, the syntax that I prefer using is this one. So when you're typing out uh, an enum case in Xcode, the compiler will autocomplete the call site name current for you. So all you have to do is hit enter and then start typing a variable name. So that's kind of why I prefer this syntax because it's it's the one that the tools are kind of encouraging you to use. Um, and this one also works really well with adding let after the enum case because it'll apply to everything that's inside the associated values in the parentheses. So associated values really expand the types of questions that your enum can help you answer about your application components. So if you have an object that always need to be, needs to be associated with a specific case, like the specific workout that is in progress, you can associate it with the case for that enum. And in this example, it makes a lot of sense to have the current workout live within the workout in progress case so that you can pass that workout to your save workout method so that you know exactly which workout you're saving. Um, conversely, if I had a separate property for the current workout on my view controller or some other object, that, the value of that property really only makes sense in one state that my app is in when there's a current workout in progress. Um, in every other state, that property just has no meaning. So you can also use associated values to help you decide what to return for a variable. So that way the associated value basically expands the possible states that your enum can handle. So here we're using it to return a different title based on the current workout activity type. And here's what setting an associated value looks like. So back on our start workout method, we create a new workout object and pass it along when we set our life cycle equal to the workout in progress state. Another place that I like using enums is for table view cell configuration. So you can represent all the possible states that a table cell can be configured to support. Um, like maybe we have a cell that is showing a single line of text or two lines of text or two lines of text with an image view. And so when you define the cases for your table view cell configuration, you can also provide associated values for anything that would help you configure your cell. So text or images that you plan to show are great examples here. And this is a pretty generalized example. So when you are setting up your table view cell, you're probably gonna have to decide which one of these cases you wanna use based on the data you have available. 
But if you want to get more specific, you can define it like this. So in this example, our enum cases are specific to the type of model objects that we have. Um, and you can just pass the model objects into the configuration as an associated value. And so here, when we implement each of our accessor methods, we just need to decide uh, what to return for each enum case's associated value. So for a table you sell for an exercise, the title is probably going to be the title of the exercise. But for a workout, it might be the name of the activity type. So every cell has to have a title, but not every case needs to have an image or a detail label. Um, so those are optional and they can just return nil in those situations. The configuration for the cell itself also becomes really simple there because all of its properties are set from the configuration enum. So the enum basically becomes your one-stop shop for extending the configuration to support additional types of data. If you want to add support for a new model object, then you just add a new case on your enum and implement all of these methods to support that model object. Our self road index path implementation is a lot simpler too because we don't have to perform any configuration there. Um, after we DQ our cell, we just grab our model object for that row and set up the cell with the enum case for that specific type of model object. Enums also help manage complex state for view controllers. So if you have something like a document-based view controller, there are usually several types of modes that the view controller can be in, like viewing or editing a document. And the view controller is going to have a lot of decisions to make based on the state it's in. So these are just a few of those. Um, I think set it, view setup for individual states is pretty common. What navigation buttons to show is probably equally common and deciding what to do with each of those buttons when they're pressed. Um, so imagine like having an edit button in the top right corner that toggles to become a save button or a cancel button that toggles to become a done button and the actions for those buttons are going to change based on if you're editing or viewing a document. So all of those can just be methods or variables on an enum that are accessed from inside your view controller. Um, and there's, there's a lot more to view controllers too, like content selection is likely to be different based on your view controller state. You might have a different data source to show based on state. So the entire configuration of the screen really depends on the state it's in. And by moving all of this logic out onto an enum, you're going to greatly simplify your view controller implementation and keep all of your complex state handling logic contextual to where those states are also defined. Here's another example. I think workout activity types is something that might be a little bit more of a traditional use case for enums, um, but there's still a ton of decisions that are going to get made based on the type of an activity. Um, so those might be things like the name or an image that describes what an activity looks like or which sensors should be enabled, like GPS, or which stats you're going to show for a particular type of workout activity. And objects that have multiple states that are also accessed in multiple places, I think are even more important to construct as enums. So let's say we need to start and stop core location for specific activity types. So we could check for the existence of different activity types to decide if GPS should be turned on or off. And so here we're checking to see if we're a running or a walking activity in order to start or stop GPS. Um, now imagine this logic exists all over your app in like 10 or 20 places. And you can also imagine that's going to be pretty hard to maintain. But here's what's going to happen when it comes time to add support for another type of activity like hiking. If you're checking for specific states of an enum and forget to include that state in one of those places, you're going to have a bug. And so commonly used objects that have multiple states like this work so well as enums. Um, and they benefit so much from having methods and properties that are defined on the enum so that it becomes easier to change or extend that behavior because you only have one place to look to make those changes. So here's what it looks like instead if we declare our enum to return a variable for whether or not that activity supports GPS. 
this is going to be a whole lot cleaner and safer to reason about. Result is probably another example that we've all used before with making asynchronous requests. Um, result is honestly so powerful that it should probably just be part of the Swift standard library at this point. Um, John Sundell has a really good example uh, and write-up of why this type is so useful. So uh, if you're curious and you want to dive in more to this one, I definitely encourage you to check his blog post out. Here's kind of a fun use case for enums. So during a recent, recent hackathon project at work, I added Easter egg confetti effects to the Map My Run and My Fitness Pal apps. <laughs> and I used an enum to define what type of confetti to show, including uh, custom colors, images, or even uh, confetti emoji. Um, so here we're completing our diary in My Fitness Pal, and after you complete your diary, you get a little bit of confetti. And here I'm congratulating someone on an awesome workout, and they're going to see a little confetti effect when they get that notification. And here I mentioned tacos in one of my runs, <laughs> and uh, tacos rain from the sky. So here's what the enum for the confetti moments looks like. So the enum cases are all the possible types of confetti moments with some colors and emoji pre-specified. So like the color scheme for MyFitnessPal and Matt MyFitness are different, so they have different cases. Um, and it turns out, yes, you can use emoji to be the, the case for an enum. So the taco emoji is just case taco. Um, and uh, there are two additional cases for supporting custom colors and images that are passed in as associated values. So that way you can create any type of confetti moment that you want to. And the public API, when you define a new case, is there's a method that returns a sprite kit scene. Um, and it has a switch statement that goes over all the possible cases. So if you add a new confetti moment case um, to the enum, then you just need to make sure you return a sprite kit scene. Um, and this is probably also a good point, good time to point out that enums can conform to protocols. So here I'm making the confetti moment enum conform to custom string convertible and returning a description for every case. So in the two custom cases, I'm returning the name of the associated value, and for the other cases, I just picked what the name was going to be. Enums in Swift can also have raw values. And traditionally, most enums used ints to be their raw values, but you can also use strings if you want to. Uh, and this is really useful for situations where you want to define things like keys that you're going to use in multiple places. So Swift can either define the raw value for you as the name of each case, or you can provide your own raw value for each case if you prefer. So here we're defining a specific string for the selected activity type, and, and when we access the raw value for that case, we're going to get back the string that we specified. Support for string and int raw values is built into Swift, but because enums can conform to protocols, you can actually make an enum work with any raw value by conforming to the raw representable protocol. So here we have an application theme enum that describes different options for our user interface theme. Uh, so if we want to be in dark mode or blueberry mode, we can set the application theme appropriately and style all of our views to be that color. The enum is defining the options for our themes, but there's a specific struct that is actually defining the values that our UI is going to need to use to configure itself. So somehow, we have to figure out how to return a theme struct for every case of our enum. One option would be to use associated values to solve this problem. So we could initialize every case with a theme struct. But something doesn't feel quite right about this. We're going to have to duplicate the associated value for every case of our enum, and we have no way of deciding which theme struct to associate with each case when they're created. But this is actually a pretty good situation for using a raw value on an enum. We can make our application theme conform to the raw representable protocol, and then make its raw value the actual theme struct. So after we implement the raw value methods defined here, 
will have direct access to the theme struct right from the enum just by calling application theme dot broccoli dot raw value. So right here we're printing out the name of the theme, uh, which is broccoli. It's important to note too that you can only have you can't specify raw values on enums that have associated values. So you have to choose one or the other, either associated values on some cases or a raw value for the entire enum. And I kind of like this distinction. Um, if you start to notice when you're defining an enum that you're duplicating an associated value across a lot of cases, that's probably a good sign that it's time to start considering giving your enum a raw value instead. Um, probably a lot of people have heard of this feature in Swift 4.2. You can actually list all of the possible cases for your enum and Swift will implement this method for you and keep it up to date when you add or remove cases. And the challenge before in adding this type of functionality yourself was in always remembering to keep that array up to date when you change cases. Uh, so this is pretty awesome and pretty helpful. Uh, here's what it looks like by default. You conform to case iterable and if you access the all cases property, you'll get back an array of all of your enum cases. Uh, it's important to note that you do need to conform to case iterable in the same file that your enum is defined in. And if you want to, you can also provide a custom implementation of all cases, uh, which you have to do if your enum uses associated values because the compiler can't guess what the associated values should be for those cases. Um, the downside is if you do implement this yourself, you do have to remember to keep it updated if your cases change. Um, so here's what that looks like back on the confetti moment enum. I chose to leave out the custom images and color cases because there just really aren't any examples of those that I need to be able to iterate over, so I just left them out. And the default implement implementation of case iterable works perfectly for our application theme enum because we're using raw values for our themes. Um, so by conforming to case iterable, we can get back an ordered list of all of our theme options from one variable that the compiler will maintain for us. Uh, and I think that's pretty awesome. So I hope you enjoyed this talk. If it made you think more about using enums in your project and you want to keep exploring, there are actually a ton of great blog posts and articles out there that I found to be really helpful in thinking about enums in my own work. Uh, so these are just a few examples uh, that focus on enum-driven table views, and there's a really awesome series on pattern matching um, that goes into a whole lot of detail that is well worth reading. It's uh, actually four blog posts. And these are a couple others, um, and I'll post slides in Slack after this and everything so that the links are easier to read. Um, and these examples focus more on improving code quality in Swift, and they have some really great references for how enums can help you do that. So, thank you very much.